I think that's a profoundly abusive thing to imply or to say to a child that they could be born in the wrong body. I and mean, that just <laughs> having that in your head is just, I think is horrible. What the, the gender activists or the tr trans activists do is they say, well, no, if, you know, if they act more typical for the, their opposite sex, then they are the opposite sex. So they think, well, if there are gay kids, there must be trans kids. So of course we need to give them all these, you know, surgeries and hormones. And, and of course, people will deny that this stuff is happening. They'll deny that the children are getting double mastectomies even though we have the data. And I, I think it's, it's, it's bonkers. I, yeah. I, and I'm willing to say that. I think it's completely insane. A lot of these kids have autism. A lot of them are gay. Um, there are a lot of reasons that cause people to have distress about their bodies. Why is it dangerous to believe in this gender spectrum? Yeah, I'm trying to imagine a world where it wouldn't be dangerous. Let's get your thoughts on whether gender is binary. I guess I take issue with the question because gender, to me, seems like a superfluous concept. It, it, it doesn't seem to be really grounded in physical reality. So I would say sex is is quite, I'm not a biologist, but sex is pretty obviously binary. You have what are called DSDs, which is or which are disor disorders of sexual development. So there are some people who may have a mixture of chromosomes that are odd or rare or, you know, not fully developed genitalia. And these people, you know, the trans activists want to say they're like a new category of person. But the reality is, is that we're all male and we're all either male or female and people just have these disorders that put them into a not exactly a different category that it's just it's just a disorder their their body didn't develop in the way that it should have um so in terms of gender again i i just think gender is kind of almost like a useless topic a useless framework because it can kind of mean anything to anyone and that's how that's how these people get away with with basically saying well you know my gender doesn't match match my sex body therefore i'm going to identify as X, you know, as the opposite sex or as non-binary or gender fluid or whatever. So to me, it's just, it's not a, a helpful word, if is that it, makes sense. Is this a relatively new thing, this uh, <laughs> idea that gender and sex are two completely separate things? You, well, I, I, I think from probably the first time gender was used, I think perhaps the initial reason to use that was to, to develop two separate concepts so that you could have this other category. Um, I believe it was invented by John Money, who did the experiments on the um, those twins uh, and raised. He, basically, it was a botched circumcis circumcision, and uh, you know he told these parents of this kid that they should just you know, basically operate and cut off his t testicles and raise him as a girl. And this was like the first experiment. Uh, I can't remember if it was in the 60s or 70s, um, but it, it turned out horribly. And the guy ended up killing himself because he just got addicted to drugs and alcohol. He felt like a man. It, it, the experiment didn't work. He'd been raised <laughs> as a girl. Correct. So, just to, yeah. so he'd, yeah, yeah. there was a botched circumcision and there were twins of right. boys and the doctor was like right well let's just raise this one as a girl and not tell was exactly. he not told he was not told yeah yeah oh man yeah wait well, that that seems like i mean it's only a it's one it's one person but that's as, as far as we can go that's pretty conclusive that okay you can't just be right it's not just a social construct <laughs> right it's it's not just a matter of how you're raised we have biological imperatives as males or females we have you know, even even we're psychologically, certainly psychologically affected by our biology and to develop down a particular pathway. Now, there are some people that, you know, diverge from that a little bit. They end up often being either gay or just may, perhaps more effeminate male or, or more masculine woman. And the reality is, is that's totally fine and we shouldn't care about that. But what the, the gender activists or the ch trans activists do is they say, well, no, if, you know, if they act more typical for their, their opposite sex, then they are the opposite sex. You know, they're born in the wrong body. So that's where the, the gender concept comes in in play. But I think that's a profoundly abusive thing to imply or to say to a child that they could be born in the wrong body. I mean, that just <laughs> having that in your head is just, I think it's horrible. It's extraordinary. And and this gender thing, I mean, how pervasive it is has been sh quite shocking to me because mm. I was at a friend's family dinner and um, these people who are not very political or not very politically active or anything like that. And I think the, the, the grandmother was saying like, oh, I don't know. I think a boy is a boy and a girl is a girl or whatever. Yeah. And then the mums who were like in their 40s or 50s 
was saying, no, mom, you don't <laughs> understand. Mom, that's gender and that's not sex. You don't realize. Right. And these are people who are not political. And they've just heard these little sound bites. Right. And now we've got, and in the comments, there will be people saying, Andrew, you don't understand. There's a difference between gender <laughs> and sex. And I, yeah, right. but, but who has ever said that gender, where, where has this come from? Is, is it Judith Butler? Partly, yeah. There are a number of people that have pushed this concept. Jen Judith Butler is, is a key figure in this. Um, she, she wrote the book Gender Trouble as well, well as a few other books, which I read, and it's virtually incomprehensible. Yes, I think is. I think she actually. Have you read it? Uh, yeah, I had to. Had to at university. Oh, That's what okay. they make you study. Okay. Yeah, Eng it's, English. I wasn't doing gender. I was English literature <laughs> degree. I'm reading Butler. Oh, that's the worst thing you could read. It, it, she actually um, won an award for the worst sentence. I forget who puts that out, but it was it was from Gender Trouble. Uh, it, it, I think she writes that way and obfuscates. For a number of reasons, um, because apparently when, when she speaks, she you know in, in public she's lucid and she, comprehensible. Hmm. And uh, I think Helen Joyce told me that when she talked about the environment, she was completely lucid. And you and, and Helen's takeaway from that was that that was something that actually matters and that you can actually talk about in a clear, coherent way. Whereas this gender stuff, it's all just made up. I mean, she basically implies in the book that sex is is itself not gender but sex itself is a social construct and so but she writes it in such a way that there's some plausible den deniability because it's so confusing and so seemingly complex that people when i when i tell them that they're like oh well that's not really what she meant right. but it's it, it it pretty clearly is and people have taken it to mean that okay i'm gonna lose a few viewers when i say this mm -hmm. but jordan peterson who i like okay um <laughs> when he talks about <clears throat> religion goes mm. that way as well. He's, he's like yeah. incredibly lucid most of the time when he talks about psychology. It's like, oh, that's really easy to understand. Right. And then suddenly like, oh, and the God and the, the thing with the, well, you know, that's good and evil, you know? Yeah. And you're like, what, what exactly, you know? So I guess it is a religion and it's, I feel like it's a religion. Does that, does that make sense to you as well? Yeah, yeah. And on the Jordan, Jordan Peterson note, it, it, it is unfortunate that he, he almost veers into postmodern territory when it comes to talking about religion, su the supernatural and spirituality. Because otherwise he is usually quite lucid and I, I enjoy a lot of what he has to say. But but yeah, I, th I think that often people resort to that kind of fuzzy language. I was just talking about this with Carl Benjamin and Peter Boghossian mm. yesterday um, because they were talking about the, the gay surrogacy thing, whether or not this is immoral. And Carl was basically trying to give voice to some of the more religious conservatives who have a problem with it and trying to kind of flesh out why it is that they have a problem with it. And in order to do that, you know, he, he was essentially kind of using this kind of fuzzy language of, you know, spiritual and these sort of um, ephemeral things that we cannot quite measure and we cannot quite use data for. And, and I think there's a place for that. But um, when you want to be clear about something, especially when it comes to the sex binary and whether or not we should be transitioning children, um, that is giving them puberty blockers and hormones, et cetera, I think we have to be really precise with our language and be very clear about what's actually going on. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that what's actually going on for most of these kids is there's they have a lot of comorbidities. There's a lot of mental health issues. That, I mean, it's all a mental health issue, but the, you know, as I'm sure you know, uh, other people have talked about, a lot of these kids have autism. A lot of them are gay. Um, there are a lot of reasons that cause people to have distress about their bodies. And from what I understand, it seems to me that um, all of that distress could be alleviated with the right treatment. That mm -hmm. is to say, with psychological help, or sometimes there's, um, you know, I interviewed a detransitioner, Camille Kiefel, and no one could figure out what was causing all of her distress, but it ended up being uh, a combination of like high inflammation and a bunch of other physical wow. problems. But she didn't, she didn't need the double mastectomy that she got to solve that problem. <laughs> so, so there's a, there's a whole host of, of factors that lead people down that path. You know, who's the worst with the obfuscating is Neil deGrasse Tyson. Oh, yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, it's, yeah. <laughs> Planets, oh, like a planet can become a star, so <laughs> right. people can be fish. Right. <laughs> you talk, sort of talking about qubits, which is in quantum computing. You know, it's, not, it's neither a one or a zero, but there are like four or five different states that it can be in. So maybe, you know, gender is like that. And again, he, he will use gender and sex interchangeably. And most of these people do that. But then if you try to pin them down and say, well, no, are you talking about sex? Then again, they'll just obfuscate and they'll try to, you know, it's, it's irritating. It's hard to actually pin people down and be clear about what it is they're talking about. I find, yeah, I find that really frustrating. And that's for people... 
everyone's going to comment going, you're talking gender and sex. Right, we've cleared, we've clarified that. That's, you can't get away with that. Um, right, we're going to get into how we're tackling some of this in the wrong way in a bit. But tell me, why, why is it dangerous to believe in this gender spectrum? Why is it dangerous? Um, yeah, I'm trying to imagine a world where it wouldn't be dangerous. I think, you know, as, as some feminists use it and some people use it, perhaps it's not dangerous in the sense that, you know, if all you mean by gender is the expression of, you know, of your sexed body, in other words, like if you if you want to be more masculine as a woman or more feminine as a man, if that's what people mean by gender, then I think it's fine. I think it's just, it's a little too confusing. Uh, it's, again, it's hard to pin down. But the reality is because people conflate sex and gender, then a whole host of problems follow from that. So, you know, men can just say that they were born in the wrong body. And often we see now they don't even need to get surgeries to say that they're trans. They don't even need, need to get, you know, take hormones or any of those things to say, well, no, I'm, I'm actually a woman, you know, like Leah Thomas, or I think it was William Thomas before the, the transition, but not much of a transition, still f a fully intact male, which you can see in the, the swimsuit pictures. <laughs> I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, so yeah. <laughs> it's, and then, of course, you know, he entered into the, the female s swimmer spaces, took showers with them, you know, fully nude. And none of them actually even knew that a, a man, a male, was going to be joining them. And so they were all, you know, shocked by it. And they, they were told uh, that they needed to seek therapy if they were uncomfortable with this, rather than the people addressing this and say, oh, yeah, we'll just remove him from your team or remove him, give him a separate locker room or whatever. No, they said, well, you, you all just need therapy to deal with this. I mean, it's so. <laughs> and then, of course, the, the worst part about all of this is that if you believe in gender as this this almost like um, spiritual construct, this soul that can be in the wrong body, then well, then of course you know if if adults need a transition, then why wouldn't children need a transition? I mean, you're just the argument is you're just prolonging their anguish and their suffering if you don't give them the puberty blockers so that it can pass as the as their true sex. Um, so you know, and if I, I'm sure you've talked to others about this, but um, you know, giving kids puberty blockers and hormones will often make them sterile. I mean, for the rest of their life, it'll ruin their sexual function. Um, and it's, it's hard to imagine that too many of these people are, are too satisfied with their outcomes. Um, and it's difficult to get that data, but we know more and more that a, bi a bigger and bigger percentage of people are detransitioning. Uh, yeah. So it's true that like, if you, if you believe in the ideology, if, if this is something you really believe in, and again, this is something we have with religion sometimes it's like, if you really believe in the Bible and that, then you should be, uh, stoning gay people. But you, that if you <laughs> right. believe this, if this is your book and you're going to go by, you should. I think you should be doing it. And I, I'd almost respect them more if they did that. Um, people are going to take yeah. that out of context. <laughs> I don't want people to do that. Um, and if you believe in the ideology, gender ideology, then, then, then kids should be doing that yeah. because they're going to look much better. They're yeah. going to pass better. Right. They're not going to get the Adam's apple. It, is, <clears throat> it does tend to be men into women, doesn't it? Not going to get the Adam's apple. You know, I was, I was, by the time I was 14, I was like six foot two already, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. Adam's apple, all that stuff. I would have a much better life if I wanted to be, if I could be a woman or whatever, uh, had I done so beforehand. Right. That's, that's the dangerous thing here is that it's happening to kids. And like, what do you know yeah. as a kid? Right. Yeah. I mean, there are reasons, obviously, that, you know, we outlaw tattoos until a certain age or drinking or joining the military or being able to rent a car. I mean, there's a number of things that that we don't allow kids to do for a good reason. But then when it comes to this issue, this issue so many people just jump on board. And, and I think a lot of times they do it because they think that they're they want to be on, on what they say is the right side of history. So they were perhaps on the wrong side of history or a number of people were on the wrong side of history f about the gay issue or, you know, going f f further back about, you know, black people not being able to vote, et cetera. So they want to be ahead of the curve and they want to be ultra progressive. So they think, well, if there are gay kids, there must be trans kids. So of course we need to give them all these, you know, surgeries and hormones and and of course, people will deny that this stuff is happening. They'll deny that children are getting double mastectomies, even though we have the data. And then as soon as they find out that it's true, they immediately switch and say, it's, it's strange because they're, they're kind of aghast by this, right? They're horrified that this, well, this can't be happening. And then as soon as they see evidence that it is happening, they say, oh, well, I mean, it must be a good thing, clearly. Right. Yeah, they have to square <laughs> it with themselves. Yeah, yeah. Man, and... What got you initially interested in, in, the, in this topic? Why, why is this sort of, what work were you doing that led you into this? 
Yeah. So there's, there's a couple of reasons that I'm interested. The, the initial one being that I grew up with fundamentalist Christians and, and I kind of agree with you that I respect them a little bit more in the sense that they're trying to be as literal as possible with mm. their interpretation of the Bible. Obviously, anyone can have any interpretation of it. But from my own reading, I've studied the Bible quite a lot. I mean, it, it does talk about stoning gays, for instance. And even in the New Testament, it's, it's very anti-gay. People say, oh, it's only in the Old Testament. That's not true. Um, so... Uh, you know, I, I grew up with that. I believed it very strongly. I myself was a fundamentalist, super conservative Christian living out in the middle of nowhere. And it was very kind of cult-like. You know, it was very dogmatic. If you disagree with this, you're going to hell. Um, you know, it, it was it was psychologically very challenging. I, eventually, I, I saw the kind of moral problems with that worldview and I left it behind and moved to Seattle, Washington and then Portland, Oregon to very, very progressive places. And I thought, oh, these, these are my people, you know, these liberals, I'll, I'll fit in here. And then I slowly started to realize probably in like 2010, 2011. Um, and then especially when Trump got elected that, wow, th there's a lot of the same kind of dichotomous thinking here where anyone who's a Republican is a bigot and a white supremacist. They wouldn't tell you that you're going to hell. They're, they'll just tell you that, you know, you're not fit for society. Um, and so that struck me as, as pretty bizarre. And then you know, I met I met Peter Bogosian, became friends with him, and he he started talking about intersection intersectionality being a religion, and that clicked for me. That made a lot of sense, um, and so I was looking at his work and James Lindsay and Helen Pluck Rose, and reading a lot about that, and uh, and so I thought, wow, this is this is this is so akin to what I grew up with. It's just a, it's just kind of a repackaging. So this is almost like a new religion, uh, not just intersectionality, but these identity politics, uh, you know, this identity politics ideology or what's called critical social justice, or I just call woke ideology because it's easier. Um, so I started to make a series on, on that, on this idea that there's this new kind of unorganized cultish religion that's, that's popping up and is placing, you know, heavy emphasis on your immutable characteristics and saying that that's all that you are. And, and, you know, there are these oppressor versus oppressed classes. And if mm. you're a white heterosexual male, you're evil. And if you're, you know, black trans lesbian, you have some kind of <laughs> elevated status. And so, uh, you know, I started, I, I made a whole series about that. And I was just going to do another episode on the topic of gender, because it kind of fits into that identity politics category. Uh, but then when I started to scratch the surface of it, I realized that it was a, it was a really complex topic, and there was so much to it, and I had an opportunity to interview so many people about it. So I separated the series and, and turned it into its own thing. Interesting. Yeah, and your work is great um, as well. Thank you. And what's the name of your channel? Uh, the Signal Productions. Okay, and you've yeah. got some great series there. Yeah. I think, I mean, people ask me as well, why gender? And it's, oh, are you, are you obsessed with gender? I, I yeah. feel like I agree with everything you've said. Hmm. Used to, I used to do a lot on cults and things, and this seems to me like a cult. And I think <laughs> gender is the place where it is just the most obviously insane. Yeah. Like <laughs> right. if you need the one place where there's the two plus two equals five, the Orwellian thing of like the, you've got to say this to ad adhere to the party, even right. though to, to show the litmus test of how ideologically captured you are, the UN, and, and how pervasive this is as well in mainstream institutions, the UN tweeting, trans lesbians are lesbians <laughs> and things like that. That is like the moment where you're like, okay, this is the litmus test. If you can see that and you go, you know, uh, if you're going, yes, I will also say this, you've been captured. Right. Um, right. And what, what what you said before also was really interesting that it's something I noticed as well. I, I obviously met over the years a lot of people who left cults mm. interviewing them. <clears throat> time after time, they have became super woke. Like really yeah, woke. Interesting, yeah, I think it's, you know, if, if you come from somewhere where uh, there's a lot of homophobia, mm. gay people are bad, these people are bad, whatever, it's, it's natural to go, I'm going to go the opposite way. Yeah. I suppose like eventually you, the, the thing to learn is is that humans do that. We're all religious. We're all For sure. tribal, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I definitely, this is, would be pre the term woke in, in public consciousness. But, um, you know, when I left the kind of religious right, I was very interested in anarchy and far left, you know, kind of anarchistic idealism. Mm. Uh, but that quickly fell apart for me. It just it didn't really make much sense. I joined some anarchistic groups, um, but there was always a leader. And I was like, well, that's that's odd. Uh, <laughs> and then have, <laughs> having seen firsthand the manifestation of some of this ideology in Portland, I, I started to distance myself from it and realize that this is just 
it's uh, one it's it's based on faulty premises and two it's um it's just really unhealthy and it really is that that same kind of i think these people have the same kind of religious architecture in their brain that says uh on my side good not on my side bad uh and therefore you know they engage in just horrible behavior and a lot of those people ended up being in antifa and you know um kind of the militant militant part of the left wing. So um, I'm glad I left that behind and didn't get fully indoctrinated into that. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing the confidence a lot of these people have, especially those who yeah. have left former cults, cults yeah. that they often joined, weren't even born into. Mm. They, they join a cult, then they join another one, and they're just as sure the next time. Yeah. I've had so many people, again, <clears throat> former interviewees, who have seen some of the work I've been doing recently and have left public comments, just, Andrew, mm. you're, you've disappointed me so much. I thought you were better than this. Ah, yeah, That's such yeah. a horrible phrasing. Like, I thought you were better than this because it right. implies that the person saying it is the person who is better. Yeah. And they have an understanding, yeah. a moral arbiter here of this is what better is and you haven't aspired to it. What a horrible thing. Yeah, yeah. That, that is, that's very demeaning and, and ridiculous. And I, I think that t this idea of like, people bouncing from one cult to another leads me to really one of the main things I'm interested in, which is the talking about meaning, um, which I touch on in the first episode of my series on gender, because I think that's really like an underlying problem in so much of this stuff. I think it's largely, or at least partly why people grab onto these ideologies and become so dogmatic and so stringent and so nasty, as you mentioned, yeah. because it gives them a sense of purpose. It put it places, uh, them in a particular position that is kind of above everyone else, right? And um, and again, it, it gives them a sense of meaning. Uh, and I, I think there is a crisis of meaning, especially with the, and I'm not religious, but there's been a clearly a decline of traditional religion. And then you see all these new woke religions pop up and it gives people, like I said, a sense of purpose and meaning. And I, I think I think that's part of why people act so insane about about a lot of this stuff or with a lot of this stuff because it's their sense of identity it's you know it, it's something beyond this simple material world in a, in a way are you familiar with the work of aj jacobs i'm not no. so he almost in a comical sort of way but also quite seriously he goes out on these sort of endeavors where he writes a book about a mad thing that he does for a year okay and so he decided to take the the Old Testament, literally, for one <laughs> oh, year. Oh, I have heard of this, I think. Yeah, he's yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. And so he did stone an adulterer. He just like, threw some pebbles at a <laughs> right. guy in the park who right. told him he'd cheated on his wife. <laughs> so he's just throwing little pebbles at him and things. And apparently the guy wasn't happy. It, was, it wasn't like a funny thing. The guy was annoyed at him. It was yeah, a whole yeah. big thing. And then, you know, his wife would try to annoy him then by sitting on every chair in the house so he couldn't sit on the chair for like 24 hours or something like that. <laughs> so, the, you know, that was all quite funny. But then the serious part of that was that AJ Jacob after reciting enough prayers over and over and over again for months and months and months, mm. started to have something that resembled in some way a belief. Interesting. And does that sort of speak to you, this idea that uh, if you recite something enough and, and try to mean it, which because he, he was taking it seriously, that you can really go for anything? Yeah, that's true. And we know in public, the more you repeat something, the more likely people are to believe it. Um, and so that's that's pretty unfortunate when you realize that so many mainstream or legacy institutions are captured by this ideology. And so one, that it seems it, these ideas seem legitimate because they're coming from these legacy institutions. And two, they're repeated so often and at such high levels that of course people are going to believe it. I mean, you, you know, you have, you know, the president of the United States talking about this stuff or you, ha you have people in these high positions of, of authority, you know, like WPATH, you know, putting out all these standards of care for tr trans children. Um, so of course people are going to believe it. One of the issues then is, and, and I've heard this said that, I mean, would you say you're, you're a centrist, many moderate? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess so. I, I don't really like any of the labels, but I typically, yeah, I, I wouldn't really say, I'm certainly not on the left. I wouldn't really say I'm on the right. Um, I just like to think as freely as I possibly can. <laughs> yeah, so, that's the yeah. aim. Yeah. But uh, I, I, yeah, I would say the same thing, I think. Yeah. But, but roughly centrist. I, I was reading the other day that centrists are particularly vulnerable to this mm. idea of like, oh, I you know, I don't have any biases because I'm so ah. in touch with my biases yeah, yeah. and I'm so, you know, this difficult position that we're in. And then we try, again, talking about what we were just talking about before, like you leave a cult and then you go really far another way. Some people on the gender critical side, which mm -hmm. I would say without wanting to have a side is, is where we stand, take things too far, would you say? 
Absolutely. Yeah. Unfortunately, that was something that I was kind of aware of uh, a while ago, but it's something that has especially come to a head over the last few months for me, um, interviewing people like Stella O'Malley, who founded Genspect and has gotten a lot of hate from the the so-called gender criticals and some of these more far left feminist types. What's interesting is that once I started putting out some promos for my series, Uncomfortable Truths, um, you know, I had, I think, Helen Joyce in, in one of them, Mr. Minnow, Buck Angel. And I started to see a lot of <laughs> the, the main people that were starting to follow me on Twitter were conservative Christians and far left feminists. And so I would see in, in some of the far left feminist bios, you know, like the, the raised fist and like they wouldn't have their pronouns, but they had they would have other other in kind of religious indicators, right, that they were a part of this this kind of woke cult almost. Um, and I've, I've seen that firsthand where, you know, I've pe people in that, that crowd often really hate Buck Angel, for instance. So Buck is a biological woman, um, transitioned 30 years ago. In other words, took hormones and had a double mastectomy, passes very well as a man, but speaks out against the ideology, doesn't think it should be an ideology, recognizes that it's a disorder. Uh, we don't, you know, we don't fully agree on everything. I, I think Buck believes that some people are truly trans and need these, these surgeries. I don't think that. But I don't care. I don't care if we disagree on certain things. The main thing is that I interviewed Buck in large part to try to, one, because I think Buck's story is really interesting and, and Buck is very passionate and doesn't want children to get these surgeries. And uh, and I also always think about my Portland friends, like who are they going to listen to? How can I reach somebody kind of on the fence or maybe who believes in some of this stuff? And so, you know, just w when I tell them, they, they probably won't listen to me, but with someone like Buck, who's, you know, had 30 years of this experience, tells them they're more likely to listen. And so, you know, Buck, Buck has been just, in, in my view, unfairly maligned and hated. And, and I've even had people police pronoun usage uh, on the gender critical side. You think that that's just a, a thing that the trans activists do, but it's not. It's a thing that the gender critical people often do. They say, well, if you call Buck a, a he, him, then you think Buck is a biological man and you're denying reality. And it's like, no, I can hold two thoughts in my head at the same time. Mm. You know, I know that Buck is a woman and I don't, it doesn't really bother me and it doesn't, hurt any children. It doesn't hurt anyone to say he, him when referring to Buck. I just, I don't think that that's true. Um, and the, the hate that Stella has gotten is just especially irritating to me because one, now I really like Stella, but before I knew Stella, before I was friends with Stella, I saw her film trans kids. It's time to talk, which if you haven't seen it, it's, it's, I think one of the best films out there on this subject. And she was new to the topic. She had never studied any, any of these things. And the filmmakers just went around with her and had her talk to all these kids who either had taken these drugs or or were thinking about it. And the main premise is she had gender distress as a kid and thought that, you know, that she was a boy and was very insistent about it and eventually grew out of it, going through puberty, becoming a woman. And now she's very happy in her you know, in her body. And so her, her main question was, could any of these kids be like I was? And so I thought it was a very poignant film, but there were a couple things she said in the film, uh, that people just latched onto and said, Oh, see, she's not on the right side. And so she, she lost a bunch of friends who are pro the, the trans agenda. Uh, you know, a lot of friends blocked her and, and got very angry with her. And then also on this, on the, side that we would ostensibly be, be on, you know, a lot of those people also gave her a lot of hate and, and continue to do so. So it's, it's, you know, the topic itself is depressing enough. And then when you have a whole bunch of people who you would think would, would fight with you against child transition and against men and women's spaces, et cetera, they turn on you in an instant because you don't say the right word or whatever. So <laughs> it does become very cult-like. And like you said earlier, it, this is a kind of a feature of human cognition, sadly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so. I think a lot of it comes from defensiveness as well. Yeah, like threat sensor, the amygdala starts yeah, starts yeah. ticking. Totally, you get. Uh, I mean, I see it happen. I feel it in me. I feel yeah. myself becoming more entrenched in opinions as people on the other side start attacking me. I become more defensive and more entrenched. Sure. So I start sure. by saying like, hey, I think it's totally acceptable. Okay, the pr pronouns are cool. Anyone what they want. And then the more I start getting messages of abuse from mm. people who really believe in sane things, the more I start to go, oh, screw you, screw you. <laughs> right. I'm not going to now be polite. I'm not going to, yeah, you yeah. know, and that's a problem, as you say. I mean, we know historically from like de-radicalization, mm. uh, extreme Islam, things like that. We know that the best bet is to get someone who was formerly part of that to go in and not judge those people, but just to say like, 
well, what what you and Peter Bogosian do, this thing of like, how can we get you from like a nine down to an eight? Right. You know, uh, maybe don't actually go and blow these people up. I mean, the, right, yes, right. the Western values are terrible. I agree with you. I agree with everything. You're, I'm on your team, but don't actually, let's, we don't need to use violence in this particular case. Very gradually move people. And if, yeah. if we're coming out and just screaming at one side and the other side screaming back, right? Where, where how are we going to change minds? Yeah, no, I think that's a really important point. You know, people, I myself get, very, I think it's something Carl Sagan said, which is to be obsessed with reality. And and I am obsessed with reality. It is actually a little difficult for me to use like he, him for somebody I know is a biological female. It just doesn't quite click in my brain. Mm. But I, it does I, with I, Buck I, though. Buck Angel does look so manly. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, but you know, so I'm, I'm sympathetic to this idea of like, oh, we need, we need to push for clear language and we need to be very precise about these things. Um, because we ultimately we we do want to save children from from harm or even adults that have been captured by this ideology, um, but I do think the pragmatic approach is the one to take. So you mentioned you know like a suicide bomber for instance, if you can be more pra- I, I think whatever works to get them from not blowing themselves up and other people, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you don't have to convince them to be an atheist, for yeah. instance. And, and trying to won't work. Right. Yeah, it's not going to work. And it, I think it's going to cause more problems. So you have to like not only pick your bat- battles, but also be intelligent and, and, re- and reasonable about how you approach certain types of people. And and yeah, just I think the, the approach is really important. Mm. And then it's about are we trying to just win an argument or are we trying to actually convince minds I suppose the other argument with the pronouns, what I've been hearing from a lot of gender critical people recently is, well, if you start saying she, it's much harder to say she can't come in the in the women's bathroom. Mm. And that, that, I mean, I think that's logical as well. So then we're weighing that up with, yes, but you're also not going to be able to convince people away from a dangerous ideology if you don't go along, if you don't give some in somewhere. So these are the two things I guess we're weighing up. Yeah, it's challenging. Yeah, and I, I know Kelly J. Keene has this hashtag, hold the line. That's her main thing. She wants to always hold the line and has to be very stringent about that. And I, I, I get it, but I, I do think that um, in certain circumstances, it just it just doesn't make sense, especially when you're holding the line against somebody, for instance, like Stella, uh, who's done more than most people I know to help, you know, detransitioners, to help families, um, she founded Genspec, which you know gives help to all, to all these people that, that are what they call lost in transition, who either regret the transition or want to detransition, or just don't know quite where to go. Um, and and they've just done such great work. So when holding the line comes at the the cost of defaming somebody or trying to ruin someone's movement, who's done so much good in this area, I think you have to ask yourself, what are you doing? Yeah, and is it really like she spent? hours and hours on Twitter spaces, you know, deriding this conference that happened in in, um, in November of last year in Denver that Genspec put on. It was a fantastic conference. I, I don't think there's anything that they would probably like really disagree with too much. Some of these critical, g- g- gender critical people at the conference. Um, I mean, there were a lot, there was disagreement, but the over, again, like the overall goal is to stop children from taking these drugs and getting these surgeries and stop men entering into women's spaces uh, I, I you know if we can achieve those two things the other stuff i'm sure there are other issues but those to me seem to be the most important and yeah like you said i think i think we need to be somewhat flexible in figuring out the best way to achieve those things there will be people as well commenting some extreme gender critical people and <coughs> extreme trans people saying these are two men talking about something that is not for men, it's for trans women, they'll say that. And on the other side, they say this is about women and two men are saying it. Um, later, I'm interviewing uh, a, a trans person called mm. Katie John, Katie John something. Okay. Um, yeah. And again, I know I'm going to get shit from both sides uh, yeah. because Katie is sort of a, is one of those who's, who's a bit in between, understands both sides yeah, a little yeah. bit. Uh, and the gender critical will we'll say again, here are two men discussing what is a woman's issue. <laughs> right. But I, I, I find that really difficult because I think that that's a very woke argument coming from what is supposed to be an anti-woke argument. This idea of like, you yeah. can only comment. I, I think, it, of course, it's important to take into consideration uh, the people this really affects. But of course, you have, to, you, have to have, you have to be able to opine, don't you? Of course. Yeah. I mean, that's something called standpoint epistemology. So your standpoint in the world 
in other words, your immutable characteristics, what makes you a biological woman or, you know, whatever it is, it can be, uh, this is where intersectionality comes in. You, it could be, you know, a black woman or a disabled, whatever. That gives you a particular viewpoint on the world and your epistemology falls from that. So in other words, you have the lived experience that makes whatever it is you're about to say about your position and dealing with these issues, somehow it makes it more true. But who cares if two guys are talking about it? If what they're saying is true, then what they're saying is true. Yeah. I mean, why does it matter if we have light colored skin or have genitals that don't match the people? I, it just it makes absolutely Speak no to yourself, sense. Mate. <laughs> mine, are, yeah. mine match whatever. Um, no, <laughs> they're um, fluid. <laughs> also, what we're seeing, I guess, on the gender critical side is it, and almost something that might turn into war in itself. And I guess mm. it's what you're touching on. Yeah. You've got sort of like an atheistic left gender critical and you've got a, a religious right. Is that what you're seeing? Yeah, yeah. And interestingly, I've, I've gotten both support and hate from both of those, <laughs> those those sides. I showed the first episode of my series at the conference that I mentioned, the GenSpec conference, and it has Buck in it. And, you know, I, I got people, we did a Q&A afterwards, and I got some of the more gender critical left leftist types. I mean, I don't know exactly how they would, would identify, but that's my assumption based on their comments. You know, this one woman held up her phone and said, do you, do you know that Buck has done porn and shows Buck's porn? And I was like, yes. And I don't think that that's relevant. I don't see how that matters to uh -huh. this conversation. You know, that I wasn't highlighting Buck's porn. I wasn't promoting Buck's porn. This is yeah. just not relevant. Don't keep saying porn on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but anyways, she was very upset. She huffed out into the hallway and like showed everyone else what was on her phone and i thought it was kind of hilarious really oh so she's going around now showing the, the, yeah, the stuff the yeah, pictures, I love that. yeah yeah like there's like, a simpsons character there's uh, <laughs> one of them i can't uh, think of the children this right, right exactly yeah. yeah love that yeah and then i got somebody else afterwards who gave me a very firm handshake this older gentleman and it's like oh, I, I loved your film but you really need to think about removing buck from the film and i was like oh wow and i'm completely convinced that this is a very, very conservative Christian. Um, and I had a number of people tell me that. They told me to re-edit my film, take this person out of the film. And it just blew me away. I've never had people tell me to re-edit my film. And, and I was thinking, well, do you want to give me several thousand dollars so I can fly somebody <laughs> else in? And you know, I was just like, this is... And the interesting thing is that there was no problem whatsoever with any of the content in the film. So there were no arguments against what anyone said, including Buck, because I think, you know, I, I included stuff in the, in the film that I agreed with, and I think they all agreed with me, and they all agreed with basically everything in the film. There were literally zero comments about, oh, well, I didn't like what Buck said here, or I didn't like what Stella said there. It was not, it was not about that. It was just, there's an aura about these people. It's like, it's almost, ma it's like a mystical spell, and if they're in it, then uh, there's something wrong with it. <laughs> Do you think it's, it's fair to s surmise then that because the gender ideology is so insane, and I, I think it's 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 bonkers. I, yeah, I, and I'm willing to sure. say that. I think it's completely insane that it it, it moves us emotionally uh, in such a way that we move away from enlightenment values. Basically, that an individual, providing they're not causing obvious harm. And I know people might say, "Oh, they're oh, but what about the you know if you call someone a woman, then they might it's harder not to let them." Okay, yeah, well that's yeah. quite abstract, and that's quite you know if someone's not really causing harm to other people that they should be able to pretend they're a banana and if <laughs> sure. it doesn't affect me and yeah. as long as they're not allowed into banana changing rooms <laughs> and banana prisons and right. banana sports teams right couldn't care less and, and i actually embrace <laughs> their insanity providing it doesn't bother <laughs> me right yeah, I mean, I think one could make an argument that often it does affect other people in their family or, you mm. know, sometimes older men will transition because of being autogynophilic, uh, which is an attraction to oneself as a woman, as, as a man. Yes. Um, so, but, but even so, yeah. I mean, I saw Helen Pluckrose arguing this point. She was getting a lot of mm. ab abuse as well. And she was saying, so what if they are getting a kick out of it? We don't police people's thoughts. Yes. No, no, no. The point I was making is that if they're already married and they have children, this can be very challenging for the kids oh, yeah. and for the wife. Um, so I think that's, that's something to take into consideration. If they're single, I mean, yeah, who cares? I mean, wear a dress, what a, you know, I personally don't care. So yeah, I, I do think it's, it is complicated because there are so many factors and we do have to think about at least how it affects people close to us in society in general. But I, I ultimately take your position that you know, if they're an adult and they want to do this, that they should be allowed to. Um, 
at the same time, I'm worried about this cultish ideology that convinces even adults that they're born in the wrong body. And, and then they get out of the, the, the mystification of the cult and they realize, oh, wow, I just, you know, lopped off my testicles and et cetera. Mm. And I, I don't actually think that this is good for me. You know, Absolutely. so I, I've talked to a lot of people like that who are, were adults when they did the surgeries and stuff. And so, you know, again, I don't want to ban ban these surgeries or anything like that. Um, but I do, I had a, an interesting disagreement with Peter about whether or not it sh you know, 25 should be the legal age, um, because the brain is fully formed and perhaps people, fewer people would be, you know, would regret their surgeries and hormones less. Um, I think it's really tricky. Uh, we don't have a legal precedent to set it at 25, but, um, again, the, you know, the woman I interviewed was, was 30 when she got her double mastectomy, uh, and then 33 when she detransitioned. So Oof. it's, yeah, so I'm very symp I'm sympathetic with both arguments. I mean, yeah. I, I I do think that we have to weigh those carefully. Um, and then there are other factors, like there are all these new surgeries that have cropped up because this has become kind of a fad. And then then you have these like money seeking surgeons who are just out to you know do as many surgeries as they can. Um, like there's an Irish woman in I think Florida who's just who boasts about this and posts TikTok videos for children and saying. You know, you don't have to be 18 if you have parental consent. And I mean, it's just so there's so many it, it, it's it's complicated, I yeah. guess, is what I'm getting at. But I yeah. ultimately agree with you. Even as you speak, I'm thinking, OK, I'm like I'm flip flopping on what I think. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, well, an individual should be able to cut off whatever they want, especially if they're 25 or older, <clears throat> even if they're 18 and older. Maybe they, you yeah. could argue that or they can go to the army. They can they can in, yeah. in the UK, they can have a drink or maybe I don't really know. And then I'm going, well, hang on. We wouldn't have a doctor just cutting off your legs. They're not supposed to do things. Like, so I'm flip-flopping on this the whole it's way. It's hard. Yeah. Really hard. Yeah. And then I guess, you know, we talked about what's hap what happens when we get too tribal and in, in, entrenched in our opinions on like a gender critical side, on sort right. of that woke side, I suppose the same thing's happening. And I've seen like, uh, I've got a lot of sympathy with the pro-choice side, for example, mm -hmm. of, of, of that debate. Uh, but then I've seen people sending pictures of their aborted fetuses to people to piss them off and stuff like that yeah that's when you want to like insane. grab someone and go okay you're i know why you're emotional i know why you're doing this right stop a second yeah and, and think the same thing with um uh with with gay rights you go to like a, a gay pride i was at gay pride in berlin and there was um i sort of looked down and there was just like a guy who had gone down on another guy everything was just out and i thought wow i've never seen that in real life it looks yeah. funny in real life it's like oh <laughs> that's i've never seen yeah. uh, that and i didn't want to see that and there's kids yeah, around yeah. And totally. How yeah. upsetting for, I mean, so many gay people I've spoken to are so offended by this, that what was supposed to be uh, a, a really important and serious civil rights battle has now become about showing the other side, look how, but that's what, uh, that's human, isn't it? You become, yeah. and that, they're sort of doing it in an <clears throat> FU kind of way, you know? Right. Yeah. There's two things that that brings to mind. One is that it's funny, all the people that I know who are gay or lesbian or even who identify as trans, like <coughs> literally all of them don't like the lgbtq whatever yeah. uh labeling don't the think it's people. exactly the alphabet yeah. people they don't think it's a cohesive community they don't like the pride parades i mean pretty much none of them and none of them given to identity politics so you know it's just fascinating that there are other people out there that do you know fit into that category supposedly and want to foist that onto not only everyone else but even the people who ostensibly are like them um, so that I think that's unfortunate. And, and just to come back to this idea of, of kind of finding your locus of meaning in identity politics, I think that, that, I think it's what leads to that sort of thing, you know, sending the photo of this aborted fetus or, you know, doing these horrible things because you're so convinced that, that, you know, you're on the right side of history and that you need to convince these other people because there's not, there's not a better, more grounded sense of, purpose and of identity that isn't so fickle and so, um, in my view, deranged. You did some videos responding to woke people on dating apps <laughs> yeah, in right. Portland, which is like yeah. the woke city. Yeah, yeah. Tell me a bit about that. <laughs> that was just kind of a, a, an offhand thing that I, I decided to do because I was... I, I'd never really used dating apps before, but I had a, a pain condition where I had to lie down f for basically four and a half years of my life. It wow. Was, it was miserable. Oh, um, sorry I, to hear that. Thank Good you. to see yeah. you out though. Yeah, no, I, I, I couldn't sit for more than a few minutes at a time. And, and so there was no way for me to go out and meet anyone. So I started using a dating app. Um, and thankfully, I got better about a little over a year and a half ago, almost two years ago. Um, so I'm, I'm pain free at the moment, but anyways, I just started noticing, especially in 2020 when the right 
riots just really kicked off. I mean, there were riots and stuff before that in Portland, but um, 2020 was the worst after George Floyd died. Uh, and I just started noticing like it was something like 30 to 40 percent of the people I was seeing on this on this on these apps were super woke and were saying, you know, BLM in their profile and just a, a bunch of really deranged things. And I would have people even girls try to match with me and then argue with me about how it's important to burn you know buildings down because that will move r racial justice in the right direction. And I was like, oh, wow, I, d I don't really agree. And and they would just like preach to me through the app. I was like, what, do you, what, what is going on here? I'm just wanting a date, you know, like, um, and so, you know, and, and what's interesting is like, you can generally filter, speaking about the trans thing, you can generally filter like you're a heterosexual man, you want to meet a heterosexual woman, you can filter out the non-binary and whatever thousand options that they have now. But that doesn't matter. You can select what you want, but you will still see a bunch of people, a bunch of men who often don't even try. I didn't post any of those pictures on the, the video because I didn't want to out anyone sure. or cause anyone trouble. But my God, they're, I mean, they just don't even try. They, they're clearly just men with beards and penises and they're trying to date other men. It's it's bizarre. I mean, it was it was so bizarre, and I just kept taking screenshots of these, and I cu accumulated so many, probably a few hundred, that I, I think I ended up doing like three different videos on it because it was just so deranged to me. So they, they would say, some of them would say that you're a bigot for not wanting to have sex with the men with the beards and penises. So I'm a bigot. <laughs> yeah, I guess, I guess At this point, are. I don't even care. I've been, you know, people will call my work far right propaganda. And at first that really bothered me. People were calling me a white supremacist, even though I have black people in my, you know, film. Hmm. Uh, Ayan Hirsi Ali, my good friend, Corey Drayton, who's a cinematographer, amazing, amazing guy. But, you know, eventually I just stopped caring about that. Um, but what's funny is on, on those dating app videos, you'll see comments, you'll see people saying that, oh, this is just, again, this is some conservative Trump supporter. I've never supported Trump. Um, and then I have other people at the same time um, saying that I'm woke. Yeah, it's so annoying. <laughs> I, I find myself in that position as well. So it's really mm. nice talking to you because, yeah. uh, but I know that like, yeah, I, if I say something like, oh, well, I would never vote for, for oh, I don't like Trump. I don't like Trump. I just don't, I do yeah. like him. I find him really funny, but not <laughs> sure. necessarily deliberately. Yeah. Sometimes deliberately funny and yeah, sometimes yeah, not yeah. deliberately. Uh, but I, I wouldn't vote for it. And that's also going to lose loads of people on that side. And what, yeah. you know, what can you do? Um, tell me a little, so, so where can people find these videos and your documentaries? Um, I mean, tell, tell me again, this, your bigoted channel. <laughs> yeah, the, the bigoted channels, the signal productions uh, on YouTube, and I have a locals, uh, which people can subscribe to and get a bunch of extra content, long form interviews and stuff and, and be the first ones to see the content. And that's uh, travisbrown.locals.com. And my first series is called The Woke Reformation. That's 11 episodes long, features people like Ayan Hirsi Ali and Vivek Ramaswamy and Neil Ferguson, Douglas Murray. And then the new series that I'm releasing is Uncomfortable Truths, The Reality of Gender Identity Ideology. Who's a heretic you admire? Who's a heretic? I would say Ayan. I mean, she's one of my heroes. Um, she, you know, left Islam. Uh, I think in her in her twenties and lives with twenty four seven security. I mean, I, I don't know how you could not admire somebody like that. And a lot of people are now upset that she went from being an atheist to a Christian. I'm not a Christian, but I personally just couldn't couldn't care less. She's still, I think, you know, an amazing woman and has done so many, so many, so much for, for women and girls, especially when it comes to Islam. So great choice. People go and follow Travis. We'll have the, the link for his channel in the description. Keep watching this channel and we will do an extra bit on locals. Just a couple of questions, andrewgold.locals.com. And yeah, click that thing as well.